right, it's so good to see you this morning. Happy New Year. Happy 2020. Can you believe it? I want to show you something that happened nearly 50 years ago. Some of you are going to remember this. How many of you remember Apollo 13? How many of you at least have seen the movie? Okay. So you know what kind of happens, right? This actually had this whole event happen in April of 1970, if you can believe it. In fact, April 11th is when the Apollo 13 mission launched into space. And on April 13th is a day that will live in infamy. What happened on April 13th? It, it blew up. A part of the Apollo capsule exploded. And we now know why, but in the moment they had no idea why. Now, I just want, there were three men on that capsule. I want you to just think for a second how you would feel if you were one of those three men. Halfway to the moon, two days into your mission, and, and actually on the 14th is when the commander actually got to take pictures of the damage, and they realized something very important when they saw the damage. Two things they, they knew immediately. What's the first thing that they knew? Yeah, Houston, we have a problem. They already said that like the day before, but they knew they had a big problem. They were not landing on the moon, right? That was gone. But what was their bigger problem? Yeah, getting home. If you've seen the movie, you know the flight, anyone remember the flight director's name? Gene, Tom Hanks, he says. No, no, Tom Hanks was in Apollo. He was up on the, he was like going to the moon. Yeah, Gene Kranz. And Gene Kranz is a real guy who, and this is a real thing that actually happened. It didn't just happen in the movies, for those of you who are younger than 50. It actually happened. And he was in charge of making sure that these men got home, but they had, a pro they had a real problem. As they started doing their calculations, they realized they did not have enough power to get back home. They weren't even sure if they would have enough oxygen to get back home. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being a simple problem, 10 being a really big one, how big is this problem? 12. Yeah, 12. It, it was a big, big problem. And famously, Gene Krantz said this, failure is not an option. That's what he told his team. That's what the flight director said. Failure is not an option. He said, NASA has not lost anyone in space and they're not going to do it on my watch. Failure is not an option. Now, we know how the story ends. What happened? They got home. So Gene's famous words, failure is not an option, were held up in this case. But I want you to know very clearly that Gene Krantz obviously never made a New Year's resolution. Because failure is an option. In fact, 80% of New Year's resolutions fail by mid-February. Did you know that? 80% fail like six weeks into the year. We're like, I'm out. I'm, now, the guys who did this study, I went to look to see, how, like, what about by the end of the year? And apparently, they gave up around mid-February, too, because they didn't look. They quit. <laughs> Failure is an option, isn't it? Now, I want to tell you this morning, we are not going to, and we can all breathe a sigh of relief, we're not going to talk about making New Year's resolutions. We're not even going to talk about not making New Year's resolutions. We're going to be in the ballpark. We're going to be around this idea, this concept. But, but I want to talk about something a little bit different or talk about the same thing in a little different way. How does that sound? Because it is a new year. In, in fact, it is a new decade. We're in 2020. How many of you cannot believe we are in 2020? How many of you remember when 2000 clicked and you're like, that's the end of the world. It's all done. <laughs> it's over. 20 years later, we're still kicking, we're still going, we're still making New Year's resolutions and failing. By the way, how many of you went to the gym this week? How many of you were not alone? Yeah, go in about the seventh week of the month, of the year, and you'll see exactly why this holds true, right? Everybody, you've got a card on your chair or somewhere around you. I want you to grab that card. This morning, what we're going to do is take inventory. Okay? We're going to take inventory in four areas of our lives. So I want to do things like I said, I don't want you to make a New Year's resolution. I just want you to do some introspection, some reflection in four areas. And they're right here on the card. I want you to think, and I want you to answer this question in two ways. Where are you right now? 
And where would you like to be in about 12 months, okay? So let's walk through this together. And I've already done it. I filled mine out. Now, there's two things I want you to be here. Number one is I want you to be honest. Be honest. I'm not going to collect these. We're not going to post these up on the internet. It's not going on Twitter or Snapchat. This is just between you and you and whoever's looking over your shoulder. That's it. So be honest. And number two, be realistic. And what I mean is be realistic on the where would I like to be in 12 months. If you rate yourself all twos, don't give yourself tens by the end of the 12 months. That might, so I, don't, I want you to be where you want to be realistically. Does that sound okay? So if you're two in one place, where can we realistically expect to be in about 12 months? Okay, yeah, four, five, six, depends if you're really gung-ho about something, all right? So category number one is what? Where are you emotionally? That's your feelings. How are, you, how, how are you feeling about life right now? How are your emotions right now? So I want you just to circle that number. How many of you would like to know my number? No. I just told you I'm not sharing. <laughs> All right, now take a second and think about where would you like to be 12 months from now emotionally? How, where would you like to be emotionally? I will tell you that I think this is my biggest area for improvement in this next year. Okay? Number two is spiritually. Where are you spiritually right now? Be honest. And where would you like to be in 12 months? I wish I could see the answers. I think it'd tell me something about each of you. All right, number three. Number three. Physically. physically, right. Where are you physically? Now, this is the one we usually like right about now we're thinking about, right? Our staff's going through fitness challenge. Our team's going to win. The other team's going to lose. It's okay. They'll, they'll, they'll need some help emotionally, so you can be praying for them. Physically, where do you feel like you are? And where would you like to be in 12 months? I see a couple sixes in the room. My wife's not here, so I don't see any tens, so. Make sure, hey, you tell her all the bad things I say. Make sure you tell her the good one I said, all right? All right, number four is mentally. Where are you in your brain, in your head? Some of you, this, you're going to say, there's a low one right there, Pastor. I don't know where I'm at mentally. Where would you like to be in 12 months? Okay, is everyone taking inventory? Taking a little stock in each one of these four areas? Everyone good? All right, everyone look at your neighbor's card and make sure they're good. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's the big question you should be asking. Why these four things? What do these four, where did I get these? And, and what difference do these four things make? And that's a, that's a great question. And I want to answer it in a roundabout way, but I'll get there. So just hang with me for a second. I want to start by telling you what our mission as a church is. And reminding you what, why we exist. Why we are here as a church. Why I get up every, every Sunday why we're here, why we do the things we do, why we have groups, why we have kids ministry, why we have coffee and, and security teams and greeters. Why are we doing all of this? Why are you all coming here week after week after week? What is the point? Our point is to help you become everything that God has designed you to be. Got it? This is why we're here. I want my my, my, the driving force of my life, the reason I do ministry, is I believe that God has created you as, to be a masterpiece. There is a plan that God has for your life. God sees something in you. He's made something in you. He's put something in you. And that very thing that he's put in you got corrupted somewhere along the way. But God wants you to be the best you you can be. And I know that we're all different. We all think differently. We all act differently. We believe different things. I don't, it's a big secret, but there are different political affiliations in this room. There's people that live in different parts of the county. There's people that like trucks. There's people that like Priuses. There's people that make fun of people who like Priuses. 
We run the whole gamut. There are people that love the Denver Broncos and there's people that love the Patriots and everything in between. I didn't say that to boo. But my point is, we're all, we're all here. The one thing we have in common is God loves us and he created us and we want to help one another become everything that God wants us to be. That's why we're here. Which kind of brings me back to this. So one of the things I want to do and that we're going to do over the course of this year is help you achieve this goal. Here's the thing. 12 months from now, you know what the truth is about this piece of paper? He'll be long gone. You and I will not remember this score. We will not remember this conversation. You don't believe me? Tell me what I preached on this Sunday one year ago. Can anyone tell me the title? Right. I can't either, and I preached it. I can, but that's because I went and looked it up, okay? The, the, the point is, you're not going to remember this. But this is still important. And the reason these four things are important is not because I say so. Where did I get these four things? I got these four things from Jesus. Jesus says these four things are critical for you becoming everything that God wants you to be. So, but I don't want you to take my word for it, so I want you to grab your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. And this is an interesting, it's interesting that we're talking about this this morning, because if you remember last week, I talked about a man, the rich young ruler, you remember that? And the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him a question. What did he ask him? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life, to achieve eternal life? What do I need to do? Yeah, essentially, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to spend all of eternity with God? And, and Jesus answered him. He said, you know, you've got to follow the Ten Commandments, or he gave him six of them. You need to follow the commandments that God has given you. And the guy says, cool, I've done it. He says, okay, just do one more thing. Go sell everything you have, and then come and follow me. And the, and the dude hung his head and walked away and said, I can't do it. But the question was, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Look how this story begins. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What's the question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? The exact same question. And Jesus in, in responds kind of the same way. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He gives a different answer than the rich young ruler did, but what does Jesus say about this answer? Say, so you've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Conversation was almost done. We're not going to talk about the rest of the conversation. The guy was trying to get around, he's trying to find a loophole, so he asked, who is my neighbor, Right? And Jesus launches into the whole Good Samaritan piece. But before we get into that, I want to talk about this answer that he gave, which is the correct answer. And it is not out of the Ten Commandments, is it? Where is it from? Anyone know? You should know because there's a little asterisk in your Bible and it tells you where it was from. Where is it from? Say it louder. Deuteronomy 6.5. That comes straight out of the Old Testament. And when you start to unpack what, what, what's being said here, there's four things out of Deuteronomy 6, 5, out of Luke 10, 27, that we need to pay attention to. It says, we need to love God with what? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Does that sound familiar? What does heart sound like? Emotions. In fact, when you look at that word in the Greek, and I'm not going to go through all the Greek. If you are interested in the Greek, there are resources for you to figure it out. But that word in the Greek means that our internal feelings, the things we feel, the things, the things that our impulses, our affections. It's the feeling side of us. Men just love this one. Let's talk about your feelings. Ladies, go home, tell your husbands or your boyfriends, can, can we have a conversation about your feelings? And just watch the blood drain out of his face. It's like, can we talk about anything else? Literally anything else. But this is important, isn't it? Our emotional health, the things we feel, 
our affections and impulses matter. And we're supposed to love God with all of our feelings. All of our heart, everything that we feel, our affections are supposed to be focused on loving God. So should we have, should we be emotionally strong? Should we grow emotionally? If we'd like to get closer to God and love God better in this next year, should our emotions be a part of that process? Yes. All right, number two is soul. What does that equate to? Spiritual. In fact, the word there again means exactly what we think it means. This is talking about the immaterial part of us that makes us who we are versus a bug who it is. Now, some of you love bugs, I know. But if a spider's in my, my house, it's gonna die. <laughs> if it's a big spider, it's gonna die. If there's a mouse in the house, we're moving. <laughs> if I see it. If there's a snake in the house, we're burning the whole thing down. It's just gone, right? The, this, the word here, this is what makes humans truly human. And it's hard to express. It's our soul. It's the spiritual side of us that connects us with God in a way we can't even explain. Do we need to be spiritually strong if we want to become more like God and become everything God wants us to be? Yes. All right, number three, strength is the physical. And again, that's exactly what the word means in Greek. It means the, the physical part of us, our bodies, our, our sense of touch and smell. It's, it's literally the physical strength that we have. It's the thing that we are able to do things with. So not only do we need to feel things and believe things, by the way, the believing is the spiritual side of things. We need to feel and we need to believe things, but we also need to do stuff. And to do stuff, we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? So physically, we need to be strong. We need to be healthy. Can I just make a bold statement? And I've, I'm as guilty of this as anybody in the room. If you are physically weak, you are not everything that God has designed you to be. You are the temple of God. What kind of temple have you created for God? That makes going to the gym look a whole different, doesn't it? I'm not going just for me. I'm going because I want to make God's house look good. Amen? All right, number four, our mind, which is the mental side. It's our reasoning. It's our thinking. So you start thinking about this. We need to love God with all of our feeling and all of our believing and all of our doing and all of our thinking. That really encapsulates everything that we are, doesn't it? In fact, when you look at this whole passage, what's really the point here? Love God with everything. Isn't that a great goal for 2020? How about if you set that goal? This year, I want to love God with all of my heart, soul, strength, and mind. I want to love God emotionally, spiritually, physically, and mentally. Would that be a good goal? Yeah. And not only is it a good goal, it's our command. You know what this is called? We have a fancy word for it in Christian circles. The great, not commission, the great command. This is the great command. Love God with everything that you are. How do we do that? This is a tall order, isn't it? I mean, some of us make plans around this physical thing where I'm, gonna, I'm setting a goal this year. I'm going to be better spiritually, physically. And that lasts for a few weeks. And then the fries call. And they open up a Hertz donut in Parker. Donuts available 24-7. Good donuts available 24-7. And we happen to drive by it like every day. And it just beckons us. It calls us. The golden arches, they light that sign up all the time. It's hard, isn't it? It's easy to sit right here this morning and say, I'm going to be physically strong for God. <laughs> the question is, how do we do that? What do we need in order to accomplish? Now, and I'm saying, I don't want you just to do one. What am I saying? Got to do them all. Oh, great. Thanks, Pastor. I thought we weren't doing New Year's resolutions. We're not. This is not a New Year's resolution. This applies as much on January 1st and June 30th and December 20th 
Every day of this year, we're called to do this, aren't we? Can we do better? Yes. How? We need a plan, and not just any plan. We need God's plan to accomplish this. Now, I'm, I'm going to set some expectations this morning. I'm not going to give you all of this plan today. We're kind of setting the stage today. Over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to unfold. How do we do this? But I want to tell you that there's a key ingredient, a key thing that we need to understand out of this verse. So I want to, I'm going to put the verse back up here. It's out of the NIV, which is what I read this morning. I know that's a little different. But I want us to read this again. And I want you to pay attention. There is a key word here that is repeated a few times that is essential to our success when it comes to this commandment. Okay, see if you can pick it up. Let's read it together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. Did you pick up on the key word? It's not all. It's not all. It's not your. It's and. You say, and? What? Yeah, hang with me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Say it with me. And with all your soul. And with all your strength. And with all your might. Now, Pat, why does that matter? I, all, is all important? Yes. But that's not the point I want to make this morning. We've talked about that. The point I want to make this morning is that in order to succeed at accomplishing this, these are not ors, they're ands. It is not love the Lord your God or love him with all your heart or with all your soul or with all your strength or with all your mind. They're ands. We're to do all four. Now let's get your card out again. How's that card looking now? Now you had a little second to reflect See, the key to our success lies in the end. We're to love God with our brain, with our soul, with our body, with our mind, and they work together or they don't work at all. We need all four of these. So let me give you an example. I said, so we need to improve not just our emotions or our heart in 2020. And you can't improve your emotional state in 2020. You can go to a counselor. You can buy books. They're actually books. There's a book, a great book called Emotional Intelligence. They can talk about what your emotional intelligence in your life is, what your heart is really uh, all about and what, what it's bent towards. You can improve that area of your life in 2020, but we can't just focus on that. And we can't just focus on our soul. Now, do we need to focus on our soul? Okay, let's try that together. Do we need to focus on our soul? Yes, and we do that by reading God's word and praying. And you may have started out this year deciding, I'm going to read through the Bible. See me in May. We get to numbers, man. Numbers just trips us up. Here's what I'll tell you. If you're on a reading plan and numbers trips you up, I'm going to give you permission. Skip it. Just move on. It's more important to keep going than to get bogged down, okay? You can come back to it. Come back to it in December when you're all done with the rest of it, all right? You can clean it back up. We need to improve not just our body, which means working out and eating right and sleeping better. Some of you need to get some sleep. Lay off the coffee, will you? Put your head down. We need to not just improve our mind, learning something new in this new year and getting rid of all the clutter and deciding we're going to become better mentally prepared and I'm going to deal with things in a better way. We need to not just do one of those. What do we need to do? All of them. And I know that's a tall order. And I'm not even going to tell you this morning how we do that. But I will tell you it is possible. But here's the beginning of it. You need to give God the end. You start looking at this and say, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. No, you're not. No, you're not. And I know because I've tried. I've tried. I've I've gotten all the self-help books. I've gone to counselors. I've I've committed to reading my Bible more and praying more. That's my big one. I want to pray more. I'm reading three books right now because I decided at the beginning of the year, I, I need to read some better stuff. Again, see me in May. I don't know where I'll be. I'm committed now, right? Right? Yeah, so you're all with me. We're so afraid we're just going to falter. But the problem is, oh, and by the way, I'm, on a, I'm, on, I'm trying to lose some more weight. This last year, I lost 70 pounds and gained of that back. And I'd like to lose that again. But I don't know. 
maybe Hertz Donut will start calling again. Taco Bell. I, see, I'm hungry right now. That's the problem. <laughs> but if I give God the end and say, you know what? I'm not going to do this on my own. But God and I are going to do this. The people, God, and us in this room, we're going to commit to doing this together in 2020. That we're going to become stronger emotionally and spiritually and physically and mentally. This entire year, we're going to focus in these four areas. I'm going to issue a challenge in three weeks that is absolutely going to require that we are strong emotionally, that we are strong spiritually, that we are strong physically, and that we are strong mentally. Now, do we have to be tens? No. But we need to improve. So here's my first challenge for you. How do I know if I'm improving? Here's what I want you to do. Some of you have some, this weird technology in your hand. Take a picture of this and put it in your phone. And then what I want you to do is set two alarms, or at least two alarms. Maybe four alarms, maybe 12 alarms, maybe 52 alarms to remind you to go back and look at this thing and see how you're doing. Because guess what? If you set an alarm December 31st of 2020 to say, look and see where you're at on this inventory, and you look back and you say, ooh, I didn't really achieve my goals. Okay, that, that'd be good, but you know what would be better? Yeah, if we were looking throughout the whole year, right? January, at the end of January, you're looking and say, how am I doing in these four areas? Where can I improve? In February, March, some of you need to look quarterly, some of you monthly, some of you need to look every single day. Say, God, where am I doing in these areas and how can I do better? We need to commit to giving God the answer. God, I'm not giving an inch. And the enemy would like us to say, you know what? You're, you're okay spiritually. Focus on your emotion side, but don't worry about this thing. The enemy's telling you not to worry about something. What should you be worried about? That very thing. It's an and, not an or. So I want us to grow in the and in 2020. To give God all of these areas. And some of you have noticed that we haven't done something yet this morning. We've not done communion yet. We're going to do communion right now. And I cannot think of a better way to start the year than by taking communion. With this idea in mind, that we're taking inventory spiritually. In fact, 1 Corinthians 11, which is one of the passages we very often use when it comes to taking uh, communion. Paul, at the beginning of that, and I'm going to recite this, says, I receive from the Lord what I pass on, and I also pass it on to you. That on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he gave, had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The next verse is interesting. It says, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. What should we do? We should take inventory. We should take inventory. Now, I know I asked you to circle those dots, circle your answers before you had all the facts in. What I'd like you to do as we take communion is to do another self-examination and ask God, God, how am I doing emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, where would you like me to spend some time this week, this month, getting stronger, improving? I don't know what area that is for you, but God knows. And as we come to the table, Paul says we need to come having examined our own hearts, having taken inventory of our mind, our body, our soul, and our heart. So that's what I want us to do this morning. Would you stand? We're going to take communion, but here's what I want you to do. I want to be very clear because I've been confusing in the past. I want you to step out from where you are. We've got tables in the back, got tables up here in front. Take a piece of the elements, the bread, the cup. Take them back to your chairs, and I just want you to spend a moment taking inventory. And then when the time is right, 
You can sit, you can kneel, you can stand, you can pace, whatever you need to do. When the time is right, we're going to take communion together, okay? Let's see. Let me just pray for us to begin. Father, as we come to this table, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that no one comes to this table in a worthy manner because we're not perfect. There's no one scored a 10 on this inventory sheet this morning. No perfect 10s. Are there areas of our life that we need to work on in our heart, in our soul, in our mind, in our strength? And I just pray, Father, that your spirit will drop alongside us and just point out that area in us that you want to work on. Let us commit to doing that this morning. And then, having done that examination and committed that to you, we will take communion in honor of the sacrifice that you made so that that change is possible. And it is possible. Father, this morning we commit ourselves to you. We inventory our own hearts and minds for your glory and all God's people said. Amen. Slip out from where you are, grab the elements, and spend some time with God. stand together. You can stop playing so you can take communion. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, this this morning, we've done some introspection, some reflection. We've taken stock, taken inventory of our own spirit, our own lives. And I am so thankful that your son died so that we could have success here. So that we could be stronger emotionally spiritually, physically, and mentally to do the work that you've called us to be, to be who you designed us to be. So now as we walk out these doors, 
Father, whatever we brought and laid at your altar, we leave it there. And we walk out with a, with a heart of expectation and hope and joy and peace because of who you are, because of what you've done in our lives and the commitments we've made to serve and honor you and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Go have a great 2020. Make it happen.